We're in Genesis. You guys didn't know that. We're going to focus on um, a pass the, the, the passage about where Jacob, which you guys went over in your, in your lessons today, Jacob had gathered all of the foreign gods um, that were in their hands, uh, everything they had on, the earrings, all of those things, in order to bury them and to move on to Bethel, to where he met God, where he felt God, where he saw God. Um, and so something in Jacob knew, I cannot bring the gods of who I have and in my family to Bethel. Now, when I was listening, I was sick, I, my daughter was sick last week, so I couldn't come. Um, and I was listening to Shree's lecture, which was great, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. it was, oh, it was so good. It was so good. good. <laughs> and one word she said in there, and it, com it, com it almost completely <clears throat> threw me off guard, and it was the word pathology. Does anybody else, right off the top of your head, get a, like, a, like your, 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 your skin kind of starts to crawl a little bit, and your, your heart clenches up? Well, I do. Pathology is something that has been a part of my life for the last, you know, six years. Um, and what's the famous phrase, Brandy, you probably know? We're waiting on the pathology. Okay. So when my daughter was sick um, with cancer, and we didn't know what it was, her sickness and her cancer didn't have an outward sign besides a bump. She was fine. She was running. She was playing. You would not be able to tell that she was sick except for the bump that she had. And so... When we went through the steps of that, we then had to have um, an examination once we saw the signs, and after the examination, we had the pathology. Um, and so what you are when we're waiting on the pathology, which we can read the definition, you guys have it in your notes there, it is the science of the cause and effects of diseases, especially the branch of medicine that deals with the laboratory examination of the samples of body of tissue for a diagnostic or forensic purpose. So, in other words, we have and we saw the beginnings of a problem, and we needed to find out what the conclusion, what the diagnosis of that problem was. And so when she said that word, I thought, oh my goodness, it just sparked such uh, pictures in my head. And I immediately I thought, does the fear that I had for waiting on the pathology, does that have the same fear of, of, of idolatry in my life? Am I, am I just as afraid to, to, to look into my life and to, and to find out what is it that I'm doing to either offend a holy God or offend a holy God and be separated from a holy God? So I thought that was interesting. So anything that I talk about today is because God showed me. This is something that I see in my life. Um, and then hopefully as believers and as women, we can look at this and say, well, now how, how can I then, how can Christ shine a light into my life? And especially many, many of you here, if not all of you here, we're, 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 we're in, right? We are pursue gals, we love God, we read the Bible, we love it, we're in. Um, and so this is uh, potentially a branch for others. Don't let anybody tell you this is not important, okay? This is not a side effect of if you have time. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but this is one of the most important things. Because as we do this, we have people who are looking at us. We have children, we have husbands and co-workers and friends that look at what we do here, and as we change and we sharpen our lives, it goes out to others. So let's look at the second thing when we're looking at the pathology of idolatry. Idolatry, this is the definition that I found, <coughs> worship, which is to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion of someone or something other than God as though it were God. So we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the possible stumbling blocks or blind spots um, that we have, because I don't know if out and out, you know, we don't have probably a calf sitting in our, our living room, <laughs> I don't think. Um, we don't have uh, maybe a Buddha or some of those things that would be so obvious, once again, that we just, we would run to and say, oh, well, that's definitely an idol, or that's an idol. So what we're going to dig a little, we're going to dig deeper today. We're going we're gonna to look a little bit deeper at reality of what our idols can be. Um, so let's start off, and I kind of did this in, in the format of if we were sick. Um, uh, it's kind of like, I did look up a quote, that when we have idolatry in us or in the church, it's like having a cancer. It's like having a cancer that, that, that can spread. So let's look under signs and symptoms. So, and again, these are just things that I find in my life that the Lord has told me um, of how I can start to notice, take, take notice of something like that. Uh, so A would be a, a developed expectation. So I have a molded belief of something that will or should happen, or a disenchantment. 
So if we have, let's say we, we've gotten saved, and we, or we've been saved, and we have been in it, we've been abiding in Christ, we have our baseline, we know what it should look like, how are we supposed to know if we're not there anymore? Well, this is a potential uh, indicator, it's a potential sign that I have developed now an expectation that wasn't there when I signed on for the gospel, because the gospel is fairly simple and it's all about Christ and how we follow Christ. So if I have an expectation, I, let me look a little bit closer. Um, this could uh, be, uh, maybe we say, well, God would never want me to be this unhappy. Um, maybe we say, uh, we suddenly, or we gradually begin to expect things from God as if it were a part of what we had signed up for. Or certainly God would never allow such an awful thing to happen to me. That is mine. In my life, I had signed up for a gospel that was not the whole gospel. Matter of fact, it was completely idolatry because my expectation would be my picture of my children. Because the God that I serve surely would never take my children from me. That was my expectation. And you want to know what? I knew it. I knew alarm bells went off and my heart crinkled and everything in it when I said it. But I didn't want to give it up. I could tell you they were absolutely above God in my life. But because it is so readily acceptable in our culture, I didn't have to call myself on it. The church necessarily didn't call herself on it because we don't want to talk about it. It makes us feel icky. We don't want to talk about losing our children or our job or our home or our bank account or any of those things because intrinsically they're not bad. God has given us some of these things, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But that was my expectation. So think about it. In our lives, what have we now popped up in expectation? And with that expectation, we'll get into the root of it. Why am I expecting this? Why am I saying that I'm not giving my full heart to God? And I, you have to look deep. Because on, on the surface, these things aren't just going to pop up. Normally, we're not just going to go and be like, oh, yes, all, all these things are just so bad. I don't think. They make us comfortable. They're things we love. They're part of our lives. So let's, we, need, we need to look at that. Um, and I have under that the first John 5.21, uh, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Um, and as number one, you can write, uh, if you have a pen next to that, just write self. Okay? If you have any sort of, you're not quite understanding uh, the idolatry that perhaps is taking place, just, just put self in there. That, that should clear it, clear it up for you in a little bit. Um, B, we have a deceiving voice of exhortation. Which ex exhortation I thought of that word is, would be normally used in a context of bright, cheery exhortation. But when I did look into it, it does also apply, because um, I have to incite by argument or advise strongly. Now, can anybody think of, uh, in our lives, we don't have any voices outside, right? There's not, nobody that tells us what to do, or how to think, or what's owed to us, or how it should look. That's literally all we have. We have to be active. And, and looking and searching for the mind of God to be able to see these things as alarm bells as they go off. Because I don't know about you, I'm a super sinner. I'm not like an average sinner, I'm like a super sinner. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes when people talk about stuff, you're like, what? What are we saying? What's going on? What's happening? The voices that we listen to. Um, and I think it's, it's I, I, I actually thought of an example when we have questions so if possible, remember, these are possible side effects. Um, if I have a question about God's word, do I go to those who believe or do I go to those who don't believe? What answer do I want to hear? Do I want the truth or do I want somebody to tell me what I want to hear? Now, if we're honest, it kind of depends sometimes, doesn't it? It depends where I'm at, what situation I'm in, who are we dealing with? Do I want the truth of what God's word says or don't I? And that can happen with the company you keep. So let's start thinking, do I have idols in my life? Well, do I have questions about who God is or the Bible? And if I do, who am I going to with those questions? Who am I, who am I investing my time? Who am, who am I thinking about when I, when I have those idols that come into my life and I want an answer? Um, out, people outside of the church, why, why are we going to people who have no investment and no... no uh, Writ as far as it comes to the Word of God. Why are we doing that? We, when we're talking, you see, these, these are things we need to start thinking. We don't have Christian friends and work friends that have the exact same conversations that we have, right? I mean, I know that we do, but those are things that we need to think about. And all it does is separate us from a relationship with Christ. That's, 
get into that. Okay. Um, the verse that I have under that is 1 Corinthians 15.33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Which, you know, and these are things that we've heard before, but maybe if we kind of talk about them or say them in a different way. And, you know, we we're talking about in our class today, of, and maybe there is a, there's a better answer. I couldn't find one. But why did Jacob bury the idols and not burn them? Not destroy them? I don't know, but I do know four or five hundred years later, when Joshua brings them back to the city, we're having the same doggone problem when it, ha when it comes to idols. So maybe there, it, there's a picture there of something that we do and we hide them away. We don't necessarily get rid of them. And good thing for sanctification and grace, right? Because this is what Jacob found. Jacob had been with and met the God there, and then he went away. And then he came back to where he was supposed to be. And you know what God did? Welcome back. Right? And that's the God that we have. We have a grace-filled God. Thank the Lord that that is because we never would be able to do it without his grace. Um, and then C uh, is a convincing explanation. A reason or a justification given for an action or belief. Um, this is kind of my favorite. <laughs> because I feel like we all do it. Um, it's the easiest for me to identify, and it's super easy for me to identify in other people. Um, when you have a Bible study, for example, and they say, gosh, I just so want to be there, and I just have a million things to do. I just can't ever seem to get there. Oh, I think that that's interesting that we feel that some way, if we say it in a certain way, or if we say it loud enough, that it's going to make sense to us. Or God's going to be like, you're right. You are super busy. I am just so glad that you stayed at home and ate ice cream instead of meeting with the women of God that love you. I don't think. Now, this, this, is, this, is, this is the totality of it. I'm, I'm not talking about it every single time and you're sick and I'm, that you have to listen to the totality of it. But we find that all the time. Do you guys find that your small groups are dropping off? that when you used to get together, the numbers were getting smaller. Um, I have, and I'm wondering, I don't understand. We have, we have life-sustaining material. We have people around us that love us, they're invested in us. What are we doing? Something has happened. Something has taken the place of why this is, was important, and it has, starts with our hearts, like Cherie said in her last lecture. But then it becomes now a lifestyle and we don't even know, we don't even know we missed it. Oh, shoot, last Monday was Bible study? I totally forgot about that. Because we have replaced it with something else. But you notice what always happens when people come back? What do they say? I miss this. Because our soul is craving it. Because the God of the, the, the universe is worthy of it. Um, so those are some things to think about and some signs and symptoms. Like I said, and I go back, this is, it, it kind of touches me because of Lainey. Many of you know our story with my daughter Lane. Um, she had no outward signs, and maybe we don't. Maybe we look pretty good. Maybe we got it. Maybe we feel like we got it all together. And you know what? If you do, God bless you. You should be up here talking. <laughs> but a lot of times, there's these secret things that we have to look into. Lainey's sign was a bump. I had to investigate it. And you want to know if we talk about adultery? I wasn't going to say this, but I will. It's in the Bible. In Deuteronomy, it talks about if you investigate it, you look at it, and you find out, is idolatry happening? And if it is, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to kill everybody. That's the significance of the stealing away from God's glory. That it was punishable by death. That's how bad it is. Do we look at that in, like in our life? Do we see that what we're doing and we're stealing away not only from God, but from ourselves? That he wants to be able to give us relationship and and love, and these things that he promises us. So we, we have to think about that, that not only do we have a glaring sign, because we all can point to those people, right? I mean, I feel like, oh, you got a problem. you got a problem. you got a problem. you got a problem. I mean, I don't really do that, but my, you know, sometimes in our heart, we feel like, well, you need to get this straight. Well, part of it is, we should be able to talk to one another. We should be able to do that. That's the model of what Jesus Christ set up, because we should be so needy to be in relationship with him and with others, that we crave for somebody to point out why. Why are we not in relationship? That's what it should be. But I know, what I, I mean, my guard can go right up. Somebody says, Bethany, I'm like, mm -hmm. that's, so, so these are things we need, we need to be thinking about. Um, 
so in as, as B, so we've, we've gone from there, now we have some, some signs and symptoms. We need to have an examination. Now, remember, the only reason we can even examine ourselves is because of Jesus Christ. The only reason we can even look at half sin in our life is because the picture of his holiness up against our sin is so glaring and blinding that he gave us the ability to say, it's not like Christ. I need to, I need to confess this because all it does is push me farther away from him. So I, this is a quote from Tozer, which I want you to think about. He said, an idol of the mind is as offensive to God as an idol of the hand. The danger of idolatry is not found simply in the things we can hold and label as idols. Idols are conceived deep in the human soul, evolving in the mind, and poisoning the will long before they are evidence in behavior or objects. And I think about that. It makes sense to me that there are things maybe I didn't think were so bad five years ago that now would seem appalling or vice versa. Um, so in this part, we do need a soul evaluation. Like I said, a lot of these things aren't, aren't, aren't huge things that we think are huge things. Um, but they, they still, if they keep us from separation or relationship with God, then we, that's a problem. So these are some questions that I found. And I'm going to go through each one because I want us to think about it. Um, and this, these, are, these are potential hidden, hidden idols, okay, in our life. These aren't, these aren't going to be the big ones. We all know what those are, right? Like it's the love of money, um, we, we want what somebody else has, which covetousness is idolatry. Um, that we want our jobs or we want somebody else's husband, you know. Okay, she's like, I don't want <laughs> um, So let's look at some of these questions. What do you feel like you have to have to be happy? What do you, what do you think about in the middle of the night or when you first wake up in the morning? I thought that was interesting. Because if we were to be honest with ourselves, what do we do? What do we think about? I mean, we have a list of things we have to do, um, and, and where does God come in to those things? And again, I know for me, well, I'll get I'll get past that in a minute. Okay, what do you spend a lot of your day of your time on each day? What do you worry about? What would you have a hard time giving up for a month? What makes you stressed out or depressed? What do you fear? Do you, do you guys think that fear, anything related to fear, can be an idol? I mean, it doesn't sound right, right? Like, you think, well, of course, I'm afraid of it. Why would I, why would I invest myself into it? Fear is so consuming that that's exactly what it becomes. We don't let God have it because we have to control it. So if we control it and God can't have it, what is it? Let's think about it. Right. Um, let's see. What do you do when you're stressed out uh, or depressed? That's a good one. Like, when I like, over that one? about it. What do we do? These are all things that we can think about. We can cry. That's okay. You know God holds our tears in a bottle. Um, in what areas of life do you experience the greatest struggle? What do you escape to when you're having a hard time in life? What do people tell you that you spend too much time on? What do you hide from others? What do you talk about too much? What could you not live without? And this was mine I put in there. Is Do you have an if call? I did. I absolutely had an if clause. And I said it out loud, which was like the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> and I said, God, if you take my kids, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I mean, I will serve you. I will give you anything you want. But if you mess with my children, I'm done. Because to me in that time, a loving God just wouldn't do that to somebody who's willing to serve him. I mean, the idolatry abounds. I, I, I absolutely, he was, he was in a completely way below my children. But through the process of what happened was the most beautiful, grace-filled, God-giving, loving example of who he was to me that he took my child. And I have never felt more loved. My child has never felt more loved. Does that even make sense in the human world? It doesn't. The flesh can't can't it can't make sense of, of what happens when something like that goes on. To, how do you find more love with God? How does God seem more grace filled? How does now how does how does it make my my line of where He's on top? How does that even happen? It's Him. It's His mercy. It's who He is. It cannot be found in this world because it doesn't exist in this world without Him. Um, so this is what I have under this, and, and the if clause, think about it. I don't think
think I'm the only one, but let me tell you what it did, is it created great anxiety in my soul. I thought it wasn't. I thought I was holding on to it because if I put that as an idol, I had control of it. I'm going to have it right here. I'm going to have it in my pocket so God can't have it, and it's going to make me feel good. It does the exact opposite. You think these idols in our life make us feel good? They don't. They make us feel exactly what Satan wants us to feel, which is less than, which is not his child, which is not loved, anxious, all of these things that I have to do because I have to protect it. It's totally the opposite of what God tells us it is when you, when you give it. But you have to look inside. Why don't I have the relationship with Christ that the Bible says? Well, why am I not interested in the things of God? Why do I make a hundred excuses why I don't want to be a part of anything God has? Why is one of the best Bible studies that I've ever come into contact in my life have empty seats? I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's thousands and thousands of women around in our area that do we feel the necessity to go and tell them, guys, you need to come here. You're going to get the truth. You're going to feel love. We're going to talk about God. And you know what? To my, to my, my great embarrassment, I've done it twice. One of them's here today. <laughs> Listen, it's important. And I want us to think about it. If you've not invited somebody to Bible study, you better double check if you have an idol in your life. I'm just saying. Because it's true. And it's okay. Because God redeems and he fills that spot right up when you let him. And it's a hundred times more than sitting here and doing nothing. So let's think about it. So this is what I have under diagnosis. When we look at these things in our life, is this the all exclusion? I don't know, but this is what I have, so we're going with it. It's idolatry. Now listen, the definition of idolatry is anything we want more than God, anything we rely on more than God, anything we look for for greater fulfillment than God, idolatry is thus the hidden sin driving all other sins. That's right. Think about it. Oh, that's my baby. Ooh, she's, 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 happy. Happy. she's not happy with she's you right now. She's not happy. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. We'll make this go by. Um, she's okay. God bless her. Lord Jesus, please help her. Okay. Yeah. Um, John Piper wrote, do not exchange your God for anything. Exchange everything for your God. Does that, you know, when we start to think about those lines, because you guys get, you getting goosebumps? Mm -hmm. You know why? Because it's good. He is good. And when we sit back and we hear other people and we take the wrong company and we start to make excuses, we think we're doing good for ourselves. We're not. It's miserable out there without God. I've been there, and guess what? you got to stay every day in it. What does he say? you got to take up your cross every day. Why? We can't live on yesterday's victories. We can't. We forget. We're the flesh. We're people. I, I can't do it. You want to know what? When Lainey left this world, you know what my last words to her were? As she took her last breath? Run to Jesus. That was my last phrase. But can I tell you, do you think I live there every day? I don't. There's some days I want to take it back and say, I want her back. Nope, I, I don't. I want her back. That was for then. I was strong then, and I don't want it now. But you know what I got to do? I got to go back to the beginning. I got to remember what is true. I got to put those idols of self and what I want. There is a better world coming. And so if I can get closer to my Savior, and I can give up my anxiety, and I can throw away the problems that I have due to myself, why don't I want to do it? It's because the devil tells you it's not true. We need, we need to fight it. So let's think about it. Because let's see, if we can get a hold of this, right? If we can get a hold of this, and we can say, you know what? No, I'm done living this, this mediocre life of, of, of the gospel. The gospel is explosive. Right? And we started telling people, Quinn, I tell you, I want you to come because this, this is the best thing that I know. So we started telling people that, listen, just come. There's, there's friends. We talk about the word of God. Let's see these seats filled up, right? Let's see these women come in here and be like, I didn't know. I didn't even know we could have such a great relationship. I didn't know. Because that's what it is. We talk about the Bible. We study the Bible, the word of God, the living. This is what we're talking about. This is happening. He's here right now with us. Right? So exciting. Um, okay, so uh, the diagnosis I have is based on examination of our lives. Now, this was interesting. In an article I read, um, notes of things of this nature, uh, a lady said that most things in our life can either be idolized, demonized, or seen as a gift that leads to worshiping the giver. And I was like, oh, Sam, I like that. Because I feel like we have a lot of choices. We don't have to give it up. My dad loves green grass. 
He loves it. The man loves green grass. You don't have to have a brown lawn. You don't have to say, okay, well, I'm done. I guess I'll just know. Where does it go in our lives to who God is? If I look at things as a gift from the giver and not as an idol or I demonize it, we do that with a lot of things. With money, you're either what? You, you, you love it so much and you're all over there or you're, it's demonic and you can't have any of it. Where is our middle ground with who God is? Right? How about sex? Or there's many other things along that line. We idolize it, we can demonize it, or we can see where does God have this and apart from my life. I mean, some are obvious, we know, that we can't have a middle ground, and we do need to think about that. But, but that's a good thought I, I really liked. Um, and this is what I had under the diagnosis, is do we grieve the sin that it produces? Do we grieve it? Do we grieve that, you know what, I don't have, shouldn't I have every day when I said, Lady, run to Jesus, and I knew it, and I meant it, because I knew the next time she'd open her eyes, I knew who she saw. I believed it with my whole being. Every day I want to live in that. Run to Jesus, Tammy. Right? Every day. We should be able to do that. And it totally changes our perspective and our countenance and everything about us. I'm going to run to Jesus today. And see, that's what it's going to do. Let me melt all of those idols off of me because nothing compares to who God is. I'm going to read this for you. Um, the next one says, do you agree that it steals away from the glory of God? There are so many much smarter people in this room than myself. Um, and I thought, I don't really honestly know what the glory of God is. I mean, you, you, you kind of read it and you're like, that, that's him, that, that's cool. What is it? <coughs> if idolatry comes down to stealing the glory of God, maybe I should know what I'm stealing. So I just looked up some verses last night after Bible study about the glory of God. What does it say about the glory of God? And this is what I found. <laughs> she, can be so mad she has your personality, Beth. <laughs> God bless you, Linda. Um, this, this, is, this is what I found out about the glory of God. The sky proclaims it. A devouring fire is compared to it. The heavens declare it. The earth is filled with it. He does not share it. We fall short of it. It's more radiant than a rare jewel. Every tongue will confess it. Night reveals knowledge of it. The day pours out speech about it. The generations are sustained by it. We are transformed by it. We are created for it. The sun and the moon are rendered needless because of it. He's the only one worthy of it. We were called to it. Steadfast love and faithfulness springs forth from it. It thunders. It saves. It restores. It cannot be measured. It is his greatness, beauty, perfection, all that he is. The suffering of this present time will never compare to it. Woo! Woo! Like it. Right? Yeah. I just said to myself, I was like, Greg, I found something. I'm onto something because I was reading it, right? This right here, this this is this is this worthy of holding on to those things? We, we this is what we see, this is the God that we serve. That was all jazzed up, right? Because you're exchanging something for so much better. Not giving something up, you're you're exchanging it. So let's think about that as we as we work through it. We're, we're almost done. Um, I have this quote: "We live in a dying and a sick culture, where you will hear and read the boast, not the shameful confession, but the boast that image is everything. Well, against that, the Bible says the glory of God is everything, and to exchange Him for anything is to lose the greatest treasure in the world for an image of an image of an image." That is futile and dark and foolish. Flee from it. Rescue people from it. Don't be afraid to name it. John Piper said that. So we're going to go on to prognosis, right? So we, we have this. We have signs and symptoms. We've had to get it checked out. We've looked at ourselves. We've examined our heart through the ability of uh, the Holy Spirit. And we have a diagnosis. We know we have some idolatry in the life. Well, what do we do now, right? Well, what, what do we do? What's a prognosis? How bad is it, Doc? Um, well, it's actually, it's terminal. I mean, I hate to tell you, in one way or the other, but we're going to go to heaven, okay? We're not going to, be, we're not going to sit in this world of its decay and its, its disease as we strive every day to take up our cross and follow him, okay? So we acknowledge it. We acknowledge I have sin in my life. You know, we love an underdog story. Does anybody hate when somebody, when they're on the wrong path, comes forward and they're like, you know what? I've done wrong. No, we love it, don't we? We're like, oh, man, it's so encouraging to us. It's encouraging to other people. That's not a downtime. That's a good time. That lifts me up when somebody's like, man, I see it. And because of God, I want to change it. And I'm like, snap, me too. 
what do I have? What can I change? Because I like what's happening here. So we acknowledge it. This is a, and the last part of this is a lot of what Sheree had. I didn't copy it, I promise. It's just biblical. High five school it. Oh. <laughs> we confess it. God says that he's faithful and just to, to, to um, what's the word? Cleanse us. Huh? Yes, he can cleanse us from our sin. There's that word in there. Um, we will, after we have a confession, we acknowledge that we have sin. Because the good part's coming. Guys, this is like a roller coaster ride, right? So we're at, if you like roller coasters, if not, that's a bad analogy. But it's like at the bottom when you're going up, okay, God, I, I, I'm acknowledging I have this sin in my life. This isn't the bad part, guys. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't where we go, oh man, it's exciting, right? We're getting rid of these idols in our, in our life. It doesn't have to be looked at as something that's just so heavy that I hate so much. No, I'm stripping it off to get the good stuff, to get the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So the acknowledgement as we go up, we're on the roller coaster, right? We acknowledge it. We confess it. We repent of it. And then what do we do? We abide. We abide in who he is, and we live an abundant life. Now, now, now don't, don't, don't take the abundant life to be what everybody's made it out to be. That great, I'll repent, and I'll do all this, and I'll have an abundant life of things. That means nothing. That's a lie. The abundant life is Christ. And, I, and, and I'm okay with that, because that's where, that's where the good stuff happens. In Christ, I don't need anything. And I told God that when my Laney left to go to heaven. If not another thing happens, not another good thing happens, not another thing, if I never hear a word again from you, I will trust you. I will follow you. I don't need anything else. I never need anything else. Because you are it for me. That's the roller coaster. Then we, then we live in him. And whatever comes our way as we're abiding and we're taking up our cross and we're living in him, we can handle it. And a lot of it, it's not going to be pretty. It's not. It's going to be hard. And it's going to be messy. And, it, and it's going to cause sorrow. It's going to, those things, but we are going to be with the glory. So I have, Sydney, do you have that video by chance? Or if that's okay if you don't. No, it's totally fine. It's no worries. I had a video um, of, a, of a song of the lyrics that I had, um, I had said during uh, another study. But the basic, the, the thought of the song are these idols that I have. It says, clear the stage, set the sounds and lights ablaze, if that's the measure we must take to crush the idols. It says, get rid of the pew and the congregations too, until all I want is revival. Tell your friends that this is where the party ends. I'm broken for my sins and I can't be social. And this whole song that we're talking about, we need to get rid of these idols in our life because they separate us in some fact or form from that relationship with God. So anyway. We're going to go ahead and we are going to close the Woo! Thank you, Jesus. I'm done. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. I am so grateful for you and again for just, I just pray that anything that I had said, God, that you would, you would weed all of me out and put you in and for your message and your Holy Spirit and who you are and your glory. That is just, there are almost, there's no words that we can only compare it to things. Um, I'm grateful and I love you and I'm so thankful. And, and you're just, you're precious and you're holy. Amen. Oh, is clear the stage? Oh, yeah, we got five minutes left. She's, she's here. She's taking care of my baby. All right. Sure.